want to welcome you today to the services, the YouTube. Now, we will do two more for now, and then later on, uh, we'll put out uh, one at least a, a week or so. But for now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 16, and I want us to begin with verse 18. Verse 18, Jesus said, But I say unto thee, uh, but I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that word prevail simply means to be stronger, to dominate, to control. It means to triumph over. So uh, the gates of hell shall not triumph against the church. We ought to realize, people, that when Jesus established a church, he established a strong church. Now I want you to consider with me for a minute as we uh, begin here that Jesus did not establish a religion or a political establishment. He established a local church. He began establishing a world, excuse me, a church that is going to have moral values, if you, if you would. It's going, to have a, it's going to have a power to overrule the world. Now, I'm going to say this to you. There was a time in America where uh, the church had a say-so. A politician was running for politics. He would say, well, uh, wanted to be a politician. He wanted to uh, run, be a governor, whatever he wanted to be. But he would always say, I wonder what the church thinks about this. Those days are gone. All right, but there was a time when the politics and the moral uh, values of this country all looked to the church, see what they thought, and the church didn't like it. Uh, I can remember listening to a guy by the name of, I believe his name was Lester Rolla, if I remember right, and there was a, a guy running for president, and he said, I want the church to vote against him because he used profanity in public. Profanity in public was a big deal to them. Amen. Nowadays, they do whatever they want to, and it doesn't matter. But I'm simply saying today, as we begin, we, uh, you and I have to realize that the church today is weak. We need to realize that the church today is powerless and has no influence. Now, let's consider why are we in such a, a, such a mess. Uh, first of all, I want you to consider that the church, the church today ought to be a powerful body. But what happened to the church? What is wrong with the church today? Why aren't we what we should be? Why aren't we achieving the things we ought to achieve? Why is it that the only churches today that are growing are some liberal church that just pretty much allows uh, the people to do whatever they want to do? Why have we got to that point? First of all, consider with me that we have moved the devil from his rightful place. Amen. Listen to what I'm saying. We have removed the devil from the rightful place. Isaiah said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That's where we're at today. Yeah. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Now understand that uh, the Bible says this concerning the devil. The Bible says the enemy has come but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. John 10.10. 10. He has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, that is our enemy, the enemy of the church is the devil. Your adversary, the devil, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. He says to Peter, Peter, he said, uh, uh, Satan wanted you, that he may swift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. You notice the devil wanted Peter. Why? Because he knew that Peter was going to be a great apostle someday. So he was after, he was after Peter. The Bible tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Uh, we're wrestling against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places, God tells us. So understand, hell and the devil are not a joke. They are not something to be taken lightly. But in the church today, we have taken them lightly. In the church today, we don't consider uh, what, what, uh, what we ought to be doing and who the devil really is. Uh, uh, one preacher, I remember, I, I believe it was Brother Harold Rogers years ago, uh, a preacher I used to know, but he was preaching one time, and I don't know where he got the saying, I don't know if it's his or somebody else, but he made a statement, he said, you know, he said, we've gotten to a point in the church that we defang the devil and dethrone God. Boy, ain't that the truth, amen? We took the, uh, we took the fangs of the devil, he's no longer evil, and we dethrone God, and we made, and we made the devil go, uh, the good guy and God the evil guy. I mean, that's basically where the church is today. Let me illustrate for you what I mean when I say that. Evil is now good, and good, uh, excuse me, and good is now evil. For example, 
We've forgotten that the devil is a serpent. Now, a serpent is somebody that's slick. Amen? When you talk to a serpent, it's somebody who's slick. He's cunning. The devil is slick. He's cunning. The devil today is a lion that goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is a deceiving angel. We forgot about that about the devil. So we allowed him into the church with, with, uh, with compromise, if you would, and worldliness. So understand, we now find that he is a liar. We find that he's a murderer, the tempter, the wicked one, the enemy, the accuser of the brother. He is, uh, if you would, a, a, a filthy, uh, excuse me, a filthy demon. He is the prince of devils, unholy, the father of evil, and he is the prince of darkness. Now, hold on, because understand that the devil is still very well alive today. Amen? Very much alive. When you look around, behind every, behind every murder lurks the, the devil. When you see people murdering and people doing wrong, behind every sin lurks the devil. Behind every disobedient, the devil is lurking. He's watching. You might say, well, I'm doing what I want to do, but behind you there's a spiritual, uh, a spiritual being that's saying to you, go ahead, man, do that. That's the right thing for you to do. After all, if it feels good, do it. Amen? And so we disobey God. Now, not only that, can I say to you, behind every bar, behind every card game, behind every rebellious child, behind everybody who rejects the Lord, uh, behind everybody uh, that rejects Jesus Christ, the devil is lurking, saying to you, not today, some other time. And you know, that's the best lie the devil ever tells. Yeah. Do it later. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get my heart right. No, do it later. You know why? Because later might never come. So do it later. So the devil tells you and I that we ought to take our time not to hurry up. Take your time. Do it later. And so when we rebuke and get mad, <clears throat> excuse me, when you and I get mad, when somebody rebukes us, Let's assume the pastor says to you, that's wrong. That's wicked. You know what you're doing? You're taking the fangs of the devil, uh, off the devil. Amen? When you say, well, I, Pastor, I don't want nobody telling me what to do. Somebody is always going to tell you what to do, whether you like it or not. Amen. When you go to work, the boss tells you what to do. Amen? Amen? When you go to work, the boss is going to tell you what to do. And then someone says, oh, nobody's telling me what to do at home. I'm getting married. <laughs> Dummy head. Somebody's got to tell you what to do. It all, it's always going to work that way. Uh, no matter who you are, I'm simply saying you're going to get upset with your, your pastor. You're going to get upset with mom and dad because they say, no, you can't do that. And you're going to get mad. Well, I wanted to do it. And they're telling me I can't do it. Really, you're taking the fangs out of the devil. You're helping the devil out. Amen. You're, 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 you're taking the devil from his rightful place. And his rightful place is being evil. His rightful place uh, is, being, is being wrong. When, when a brother or sister corrects you and you get upset, I'm not talking in the church. I'm talking even in your own family. Your own brother or sister says that's wrong. You ought to listen to that. Amen. You ought to listen to that uh, regardless when someone tells you. Why? Because the devil, uh, see, how, how, do we, how is it that you and I uh, take the devil from his rightful place? When you and I don't obey, by disobedience, we take him off his rightful place. Disobedience, uh, understand this, dis uh, disobedience is obeying the devil. When we follow lust, we're loving the devil. When you and I decide to, to exalt ourselves beyond excess, we're, 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 following, we're following the devil. Amen? Uh, let me use it. Uh, well, I'll get to it in a minute. When, we, when, we, uh, uh, when you and I decide to go through pride instead of praising the Lord, we're, de uh, we're, we're dethroning God and giving, and giving hope to the devil. You know how you and I ought to be? One time there was a Sunday school kid, and he says to the pastor, Pastor, where's the devil? They had been taught a lesson in Sunday school about the devil. And he got out of there, and he said he got out, and the, 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 the preacher said, he tell you, he was a mean little guy. He said, hey, preacher. He said, yeah, where's the devil? He said, I saw a deacon. I said, he's standing right there. He said, that little kid ran over there, kicked the deacon, and then made a run for it. Amen. The truth is, we ought to hate the devil that much. We ought to say, man, I hate the devil. I hate what he does to me. I hate what he does to my family. I hate the way he destroys my life. You and I ought to look at the devil that way. He's still Satan. Don't move him from his rightful place. He's still evil. He's still wicked. He's still the devil. Amen. But here's what we do. In America, uh, there was a, a, well, a Jay Vernon, I think it was Jay Vernon McGee gave this story. Let me see if I can remember the story correctly. <clears throat> but there was a man who went out and he was a married man and had an affair. And when he got back, he, 
I ended up with a disease. AIDS at the time, if you'll remember that. He came back and he gave that to his wife. She ended up with AIDS. Her body was weaker than his, than his, so she ended up passing away from AIDS. In the meanwhile, his wife threw him out. The kids were broken hearted. The dad had come home and gave mother AIDS, and so the kids wouldn't talk to him. You know what he did? He started going to churches telling everybody how because he got AIDS, his family forsook him. Because he got AIDS, and he went on playing on that, and people would literally get up and... Wait a minute, he's the one that did wrong. Yeah. Not the lady that died, he did wrong. See, what, what I'm saying is this, we're defanging the devil and we're moving God out of his place and we're glorifying evil. Yes. Amen? Here's a, a Magic Johnson and he comes out, what, was it Magic Johnson who? Okay, he stands up and he says, uh, I have HIV. He got a standing ovation. <laughs> a standing ovation for that. For running around with other women, he gets a standing ovation. Ain't that pretty good? <laughs> See what we've done? We, we've got it all wrong, people. Yes, right. We want to glorify good, evil and do away with good. And so that's how you and I, that's how you and I destroy, if you would. You, you and I have, have pretty much removed the devil from his rightful place. Now let me give you another one real quick. Not only did we remove the devil from his rightful place, but also we have removed Jesus from his rightful place. Right now, the Bible says that it, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 tells us that Jesus is to have what? Preeminence in all things. The church only concerned not to be following the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he want? Amen? Now, <clears throat> he is to have a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ should be above mom and dad. Jesus Christ should be above, above wife. Jesus Christ should be above your husband. He ought to be everything to us. Yes. But we removed him. His name ought to be a great name among us. Amen. I'm just simply saying to all of us today that we have pretty much removed. As a matter of fact, Jesus, uh, after his resurrection, before he leaves the apostles, he said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. All power, not some power. So right now, Jesus Christ is in the heavens. He'll be coming back someday, but right now he's in the heaven. In, in heaven, he has no problem with preeminence. In heaven, he's number one. Amen? In heaven, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In heaven, he is the master. He has all authority in the heavens. In the heavens, where Jesus dwells, he is the master. He is the king. Uh, there where he dwells right now are the souls of those that have gone on, bowed down to him. The angels, excuse me, the angels uh, glorify and praise his name and obey his holy name. Uh, the, uh, the, the, excuse me, the, the heavenly creatures are there for one purpose and one purpose only, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, can I say to you, uh, in, um, but here on earth, here's what we've done. Now in heaven he has it all. Amen. The universe at his feet. The universe says, whatever he says to that star, it's going to happen. If he says that to a moon, the, the sun or the moon, whatever he, God says, that'll happen. Jesus has all authority. But now I'm going to give you a, a something here, people, and I want you to listen carefully. When it comes to, to us here, here's what we say to him. I know that you have, I ought to have preeminence in my life. I know you ought to have preeminence in the church. But when it comes to my life, I want you to get out of my heart. I don't want you in my heart. I don't want you telling me what to do or putting any rules or binding me to anything. I, I don't want to commit myself to anything. Uh, you did when you bought a house. Yeah. Didn't you commit yourself to payments? And if you don't believe me, it's a commitment. Stop paying them. You go and buy a car. It's a commitment. You have to pay that car. Every month, you get, a, a pay, you get your, your, your bill for the car or the payment, and you got to send it in. Now, you don't think that's a commitment, don't send it in no more, and one day you'll wake up and your car won't be in the driveway. That's a commitment. Amen? But we don't want commitment. We don't want commitments anymore. Now, let, let me hurry here. So we told them, get out of my heart, get out of my home, get out of my life. Let's get them out of the school system too while we're at it. Amen? That's what the world has told God. 
Why? Because we're removing Christ out of his place. Not only do we not want him in our school system, in our businesses, I don't want him in my morals. I don't want telling me God telling me what right and wrong. I don't want him telling me that. I don't want the preacher preaching on it. I don't want tell God telling me that. I don't want to hear it from the Bible. I just want to be left alone. What, what are you saying? You're saying, Jesus, I'm going to move you out of place, and I really don't care where you fall. Just get out of my life. Let me say the next one. We do that with commitments. We do that with the workplace, with the government, with the, and sadly with the church. You say with the church? Yeah. Revelations 3 and verse 20. Gee, the Bible says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How many of us have used that verse for so many? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in him and I'll sub with him and he with me. That's what the Bible says. And so we use that for an unsaved man, and we tell that unsaved man, hey, if you'll open your heart, God will come in, and he'll serve with you, and you with him. But that's not who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the church. One of the seven churches in Revelations. And he says, I I'm at the door, and I'm knocking. He was kicked out of his own church. And he's asking, open up so I can come back in. I'm, I'm saying to you that it does happen. We might not think so, amen. Because that when they, Revelation, excuse me, Romans 121. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became, became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. We knew God, but we say, God, get out of my life. See, we have, if you would, we have, we have took Jesus and we have moved him out of his proper place. Amen. He ought to be preeminent. He ought to be the king of kings. We are to love and worship and praise and honor the Lord. Yes. Did you hear me? We are, to, we are to worship and praise and love and honor the Lord and be thankful to him and obey him and trust him. Look to him, believe in him, and count him as our king. That's the idea you and I have to have of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. What's happened to us, though? In the church today, we have said, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord, we're going to move you out of place. That's what we've done. Excuse me, Lord, we don't have time for this, or we don't have time for you anymore. And so we move Jesus out of his place, and we move the devil out of his proper place. Yeah. The devil is evil. The devil is wicked. He's behind all wickedness and evil and ungodliness. That's where the devil is. Amen? Amen. I said to you, for example, sometimes you send your kids to school and you'll pray, to, you'll pray for them or they go to work now that they're older. Uh, my kids are a lot older now, so I'll pray for them. And I'll say, now, Lord, uh, send your angels to watch over them where they're, wherever they're at. Keep them away from evildoers and so on. And that's the way I pray for my kids besides their salvation and for God to slap them around and convict them. That's another, that's another prayer. But anyway, I'll be praying for them. And all, all of a sudden, <clears throat> I say to myself, you know, I believe with all of my heart that God sends his angels to watch over us. Yes. That's what the Bible says. He gives his angels charge. Mm -hmm. Amen. And his angels come and they're ministers to those that will, that will someday inherit eternal life. They're ministering angels. Mm -hmm. And so I pray for the kids that they'll take care of themselves in case they're doing something done that God will still take care of them. Amen. I pray for them. Now, I believe that with all my heart. But I'm going to say this to you. Behind every good angel, there's also the wicked angels. Amen. That are saying to you, no, go ahead. Yeah. After all, there's nothing wrong with that. When you find yourself saying this, really, did God really mean this? Guess what? Guess where you got that from? It's not original. You didn't come up with it. Your brain was not like the greatest brain ever. And you thought you were Einstein all of a sudden and you come up with it. No, the Bible says that in the garden, the serpent said, has God said? That's where we got it from. And we begin to question right, and we begin to question God, instead of questioning the devil and evil and junk like that. Amen. Now, the last one I'll give you is simply this. The church is out of its rightful place. The church is not where it ought to be. Now, I'm giving you this because I think it's important that we understand this. <clears throat> the Bible says in Genesis chapter 28, verse 16 through 19, and then verse 22, Here's what the Bible says. When, when, when uh, Jacob saw the ladder and he saw angels uh, 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 ascending and descending, all of you that remember the story, all of a sudden he'd been laying on this uh, stone that was his, his pillow when we sing that song. And for uh, 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 like a prophet, my pillow of stone, that's what they're referring to. He's laying, on that st he's laying on that stone, he wakes up, he says, man, what a dream. What a scary dream. 
But he gets up and then he says, this is nothing more than the house of God and the gateway to heaven. This is nothing more than the house of God and the gateway to heaven. Now consider what he just said. The Bible teaches you and I that the church ought to be, uh, excuse me, the church ought to be a gospel light to the world. You are the light of the world. Amen? Uh, the only uh, people that they'll ever hear the gospel from is going to be you. It ought to be a great force, the church ought to be. It ought to be a rock where people can come and stand realizing this is the church of the living God. You and I as a church ought to be a body of Christ, a body of believers that love and serve the Lord, that live a separate life, that live solid for the Lord, that take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we stand fast in the faith, believing in God. We ought to be faithful. <clears throat> we ought to be like a mighty wind or an army, if you would. But instead, we're producing nothing but Boy Scouts, wimps, if you would, and worldliness. That's all we're producing. Bunch of wimps, <laughs> Boy Scouts, and worldliness. Yes. That's terrible. Could you imagine if right now we went into a, a war? And all of a sudden we were going to face an a, a awful war. You know there's going to be nuclear. You know there's going to be, it's going to get bad. And you said to, to, to the President of the United States, uh, who are you going to send out there? Who are the first ones to go? Usually it's the Marines. But he said, well, they're not available. They wimped out on us. Okay, who are you going to send? The Army? No, no, they, they wimped out too. Well, are you going to send the, the, help me. Navy? Navy? No, they wimped out too. They don't want to go. National Guard? Nah, they went home to mama. Who are you going to send? Well, the Boy Scouts said they'll do it. <laughs> How many of us would have confidence in that? How many of us would say, oh, man, we're, we're all right now. The Boy Scouts are out there. None of us would say that. Amen? To be honest, most of us would be terrified. Could you imagine when God looks down and he says, well, I left an army. Let me see what's left. Oh, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. Amen. We're supposed to be a force yes. for the Lord. I mean, we're supposed to be out there being a, a mighty force for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible, instead, as I said, wimps, if you would, are whiners. <laughs> My goodness, we got a lot of those. And wickedness is all we find in the church. Wickedness, whiners, wimps. Worldly people that don't want to get it together and serve the Lord. Instead, they'd rather go off and serve the devil. You know what Paul said? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A soldier is a living sacrifice. He knows he might not come home. Amen? He's a living sacrifice. He knows that he's in danger. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then in, jo in James excuse me, yeah, James 4 and 4, he said, you adulterous and adulteresses. When he says that, he's not talking about committing adultery. He's talking about worldliness. Yes. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? He said, you went, and in the Old Testament, the Bible would say like this, that they went and played the harlot with idols. In other words, they left God and took off to play the harlot. We do the same thing with God when it comes to worldliness. Amen? Now, let me hurry up a little bit here. We're not to love the world, neither the things of the world. Amen? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. God says to us that you and I are to do away with. Now, I want you, I want you to remember something. I was going to turn to it, but I, I need to hurry up a little bit here. Let me remind you of something, though. When you and I consider what I just said, uh, we have removed uh, the devil from his rightful place. We removed the Lord from his rightful place. And we removed the church from his rightful place. The, the church doesn't stand for anything anymore. Yeah. I was watching a, a preacher the, uh, just the other day. And they're asking him about different questions about sin. And this kind of sin and that kind of sin. And he wouldn't give an answer. Yes, it's wrong. No, it's not wrong. He wouldn't give an answer. You know what's happened? The church lost power. It's not what it used to be. America needs a church today that has power. Our, church, our city here needs a church today that stands for something. Amen? That can say, no, this is still wrong. But what has happened to us is this. The Bible says in Revelation 2 and verse 4, talking to the church, he said, I have one thing against you. You've lost your first love. 
you've lost your first love. All of us, if you've ever been saved, and you recall that one time when you really wanted to please God. How do I do this? Man, I, I want to please God. But pretty soon, it got old. And you turned on. Amen? And you said, well, you know, I know I should be serving the Lord, and I know God ought to be everything in my life, but pastor, I just don't know if I could do that, and I just don't know if I should do that. The truth is, we walked away from the Lord. Keep this in mind. The devil, his place is wicked. He is our enemy, not our friend. He's not our foe. He's not a friend to your family. He's not a friend to anybody. That's why when I got saved, I threw a lot of stuff out of my house that shouldn't be there. I didn't want the devil in there anymore. I just didn't want the devil in there anymore. I mean, it blew the, when the salvation, the gospel of Christ came so strong that it blew, if you would, it blew all the liquor out of my refrigerator, it blew all the other stuff, I won't mention all that, but it blew a lot of other stuff right out of the, why? It blew cussing out of my mouth, just out, get out of here, that's it, you're done. And I used to cuss like a sailor, so it's not like I didn't cuss. But what happened to me? The gospel. Now I'm going to say this to you before I have to quit here. Satan was behind all of that. Yeah. One day, me and my son Freddie, when he was young, he said, Dad, take me, uh, let, let's, uh, we, he had gone to the cemetery with me, and as we were walking, he goes, Dad, do you know anybody that's buried here? And I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who do you know? I said, well, I know this guy right here. And I know that guy right there. He, got, he committed suicide. This guy, he got uh, uh, killed in a car accident, motorcycle accident. This guy, he, they were drunk. Got killed. This guy over here died of an overdose. This guy over here, this. This guy. I mean, I went through. Yeah, when we finally got to the one grave, which was my sister's grave, where we were going. When I finally got to that grave, he go like this. Man, I counted thirty people. Yeah. Thirty people. And by the way, that was in uh, 18, 19, 20, 21. That's how old they were. When one of my best friends died, Freddie, at the age of eighteen, I thought we were grown grown men by then. 18, now I look it back and I go, man, I was just a little punk. Mm -hmm. But I thought I was a grown man. Mm -hmm. The devil was behind all of that. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. But then you get saved and you ought to say, Jesus, you're it. I'm just going to serve you. It's not always going to be easy. But you gave me power through the Holy Spirit to serve you. So I ask the Lord to help you. And then let's say, let's put our church in the rightful place. Don't get mad at the pastor every time he preaches against sin. Consider it and say, Lord, if it's wrong, show me and then let, let the Lord speak to your heart. Amen? Amen. Let the Lord speak to your heart. Amen. Let's have a prayer. Father, as we come to you in prayer, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Ask Heavenly Father, Lord, that you'll be with us and watch over us. And then, Heavenly Father, Lord, we do pray today, especially that you might help our church as we consider to reopen, help us to understand, give us wisdom, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.